My name is Clive Mitchell. I'm a geologist with the British Geological Survey. And what we're doing today, this event is called, it's at Pebble Spotting Live, Discover Your Pebbles Past. So hopefully, you know what a pebble is, you've discovered pebbles before, you may, may, may even have some pebbles with you at the moment. And what I'm gonna do is sort of talk you through how, as a geologist, I work out what these things are. What are they? What are they made of? What are the rocks that these are made of? Okay, so I promise that um, you'll be discovering your pebbles past. So just a few descriptions of an environment that you may find pebbles. So imagine the scene, it's a hot, arid, dusty environment. The sun is bearing down, there's no water, there's hardly any animals, very few plants, it's sandy. So we're talking about the environment that something like this is formed in, a sandstone. The next one, it's even hotter. It's so hot, everything's melted. Molten lava is erupting from a volcano. And somewhere like Hawaii, and we end up with this rock here. This is a basalt. Now, we're a sea creature in an ice warm sea, a warm current as the sea covers most of Europe. And the remains of these little tiny microscopic animals float to the bottom. And we also get um, things called echinoids, which are also providing little bits of silica. And they form things like this, this fantastic echinoid in a flint pebble. Fantastic. Now you're a piece of mud, common or garden mud, but you're squished really deep under the ground. Squished so hard that the mud recrystallizes, so the mud turns into rock and then new minerals start to grow and you form a rock like this one. This one is known as phyllite. This is a metamorphic rock. Now, you're even deeper underground. You're in a magma chamber. This is where molten rock it, it lives. And then the, the, the magma chamber cools down really, really slowly. So slowly that it means that the crystals can grow quite large. And we end up with a rock like this one. So this is a granite. And the last one I'm going to tell you about, we're in the sea again, a nice warm tropical sea over 300 million years ago. And it's so full of life, so full of fossils that all the sediment that drops down is, uh, drops down, forms a thick, limey mud at the bottom with, with little bits of remains of animals. And we end up with a rock like this. Now this one is a limestone. So here we go. So I've just, gonna, I've just told you about a few of the things that uh, I've discovered. Now I've discovered all of these pebbles by picking them up from beaches. Now, how do I work out what these things are by basically just picking them up? Now, there's an old adage that says something along the lines of the best geologist is the one that has seen the most rocks. And, and I'd say that's like a life experience thing. You know, they say 10,000 hours to make you an expert. Well, I've probably spent more than 10,000 hours in my life looking at rocks, probably twice that number of number. So basically that's what I'm saying is that everyone is equipped with the same basic fundamental equipment. We all have a pair of eyes and a pair of hands. And even occasionally, you can, you can use your tongue. I wouldn't recommend that, but geologists, there is a technique for telling, discriminating between different types of rock between, by licking them. So, but I don't recommend that because that's not a good idea, unless your rocks are really, really clean and you've washed them. So I wouldn't recommend doing that. So, to start with, we use observations, our skills of observation, our skills of observation to identify what a rock is. So, how do we do that? Well, using our eyes, you have to look at the rocks really carefully. Now, if you're on a beach or you're walking along, maybe you're somewhere else, you may, might be by a stream or a river, you might be by a lake, you might even be somewhere even completely away from water. You might just be in a local forest where there happens to be pebbly rocks underneath. You walk along and you spot a nice rock in the floor and you pick it up. Now, as a geologist, I can pretty much work out what this is by looking at it straight away. But what you need to do in some cases is use something called hand lens. Now I have a whole variety of different hand lenses. Now if you've ever been to the British Geological Survey you might recognise one of these. These are the little hand lens that we, we use for things like Science Week and we use these for looking at rocks. I've also got this really nice hand lens. This is one I picked up in France, it's one of my favourites. But as a professional geologist this is the type of hand lens I use. Now what these do, they're a bit like 
a magnifying glass for looking at our rocks really carefully. Typically, our magnifying glass will magnify things by 10 or 20 times. Now, what you need to do is you need to use this. Now, I'll just give you a quick demo of how to use a hand lens. OK, so if you're using a magnifying glass, you might do this. You might say, right, OK, I'll do this. If you take your hand lens and do the same thing, it's really, really hard to see what's going on. So let me just take off my, my glasses. Using a hand lens, what you have to do, you have to get the hand lens as close to your eye as possible without literally brushing your, your, your eyelashes and then bring the rock right up. And if you do that, you get the, ooh, wow, moment. You can start to see what's going on in the rock. You can start to see the crystals, the grains, the other things, the fossils that I've talked about. So that's a really important thing, is to, is to use these things properly. You have to get right in there and look, and then you can start to see things. And that's when you start getting hooked. During Science Week, lots of people take a magnifying glass and go, ooh, that's really fantastic. So, now I need to put my glasses back on because I can't see what I'm doing. So, here we go. So, I've been looking at rocks for a long, long time. I probably started when I was about five, which is about 50 million years ago. Sorry, 50 years ago. <laughs> Sorry, I'm used to, I'm used to dealing in bigger numbers than, than just years. Millions of years. So, here we go. So, so to set the scene, um, as a geologist, I'm obviously, I've got a, a, a I've got qualifications in geology, I've got a degree in geology, so that has trained me in how to identify rocks. But before we go any further, it's probably a good idea to explain the different types of rocks. So if you're not familiar with what rocks are, we have three, three basic types of rock. The first basic type of rock is an igneous rock. And an igneous rock is a rock that is formed from magma or from volcanic processes. So basically things like granite and things like basalt. This started life as molten magma. Both did. This cooled really slowly. This cooled really quickly because this came from a volcano. This stayed underground where basically the, the magma cooled down and the crystals grew really large. The second type of rock is something known as a sedimentary rock. Now a sedimentary rock forms by the process of weathering and erosion and that breaks down other rocks into sediments like sand, clay and silt and gravel and those things are then maybe washed down into rivers and lakes and the sea and where they, they solidify, they lithify into rocks. So things like sandstone, limestone, these are sedimentary rocks. And the third category of rock is a metamorphic rock. And this is a rock that has changed other rocks by heat and pressure. And as I was talking about this particular rock here, this started off life maybe as mud, which became a shale, which then ultimately recrystallised to form this rock called phyllite. So there are three different types of rock. So how do we work out what these rocks are? Now, the BGS publishes something called the Rock Classification Scheme, where we have a report for each igneous, sedimentary and metamorphic. These are the definitive description of all the different types of rocks. If you go online, look for the British Geological Survey Rock Classification Scheme, you will find these reports. They're quite complicated, but they're really valuable because they go into all the ins and outs of how to work out what a particular rock is. As a non-geologist, what you can do though is you can use your skills, your skills of observation. Now this is probably the first thing you do. So the first thing, there are three things that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about colour, I'm going to talk about size, and talk about texture. Now colour is probably the easiest thing you would think to work out. You often spot pebbles, say for example, here we go, this is a really nice white pebble you're likely to spot this. This literally would leap out of the ground. It's so lovely white and white. This is a pebble of quartz. And basically I've spotted this and obviously amongst other pebbles, it stood out quite well. So it, I, it attracted me straight to it. But in describing a rock, one of the first things we do is, 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 is basically describe the pebble. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to tell me what color is this pebble? 
what I want you to do is in the comments is just type what colour you think this pebble is. Just tell me, I'll give you a couple of minutes and then hopefully the comments will start rolling in to tell me what colour is this pebble. Hopefully you can see it and you're going to let me know any second. <laughs> I know that Julia's watching. Natalie. Oh, there you go, Natalie. You were first off. Thank you. Anyone got any advance on green? What do you think, folks? Ah, uh, here we go. Thanks, Bev. We've got greeny grey. Oh, Flora, that's a good one. Khaki green. Steve, come on, you're watching. You should be able to tell me what this is. Oh, thanks, Deborah. We've got another green. Got another vote for green. Um, Rihanna on green. That's all. Oh, Harry, come on, he's watching. He should be able to tell me what colour this pebble is. Thank you, Helen. That's green. Uh, oh, and another vote for green or oh, green, grey this time. Thank you, Tracy. Green from Jill. So we're getting a, 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 an idea of what the colour of this grey green. It's interesting because if you look, <laughs> yes, thanks, Helps. I'll wet it. I might do that uh, maybe later. <laughs> grey green. So I can see from the comments we're getting a sort of rough consensus that this pebble is a sort of grey, greeny, grey, greeny, grey, khaki green. So actually describing the colour of something is a little bit harder than you imagine. Now, and a case in point, how would you go about choosing paint, the paint that you, when you're decorating at home? What would you normally use to choose to use co the colour of paint? If you go to a DIY shop, what is there available to, to, to give you a clue as to what, what paint you're... Especially if you're halfway through decorating and you've already used paint on a wall and you want to go in and match the paint again. So yes, we're, we're, I'm, what I'm talking about is this sort of thing. These sorts of colour charts that you use for matching to make sure that you can match the colour of the paint that you use on your walls at home and make sure that the green that you used last time is going to be the same green that you use the next time because you don't want to have a, a bit of the wall which is slightly different shade, slightly darker, slightly lighter, slightly greyer or whatever. So so absolutely right. Thank you, Flora. Swatches, yes, these sorts of things, colour swatches, colour catalogues. And interesting to note that as geologists, we have something very similar to these sorts of these sorts of colour charts. And if you're interested, there is some this this. If you Google the ge OK, that's the Americanized spelling of colour. But if you Google the ge geological rock colour chart, you will discover the, the colours that. Oh, yes. Who said Munsell TP? Well done. Very good. Munsell colour chart, because that's precisely what I'm going to show you now. Geologists and, and other scientists can use these colours and can you see that for each colour you have a description of the colour but you also have a code. Now, a little bit more science coming up. Can you see basically the that this is a breakdown of three elements. You have the basic colour, you have the value, the, the brightness, the lightness and you have the intensity of the colour. So those codes can be used to help you accurately identify the colour. So when you describe your rock, if you use one of these codes or one of these, these Munsell chart descriptor, descriptors, it's very likely that you'll be able to precisely identify the colour of your rock. Now, maybe it's a rough match with this one. Maybe slightly, you might disagree, this one might be slightly um, darker. Um, I think I worked out that... Um, what did I work out this was going to be? Yes, I worked out that it was closest to greenish grey on the month or so. Congratulations to everyone who said greenish grey, spot on. But also, if you, if you use the paint chart, you might be describing your colours in a slightly different way. So rather than saying greenish grey, you might just say Forest Lake or Garden Glory, <laughs> which I think is a little bit, mo bit more of a, uh, a fun way of describing the colour of your rocks. So I think, you know, there we go. I did some matching of colours from the Munsell colour chart and the paint chart. And you can see here that I've got moderate olive, moderate olive brown. Well, that olive, olive brown that comes out as Forest Lake. And I've got olive grey. Well, that comes out as Urban Walk, <laughs> which is the funny one. Uh, light red becomes Gypsy Bloom. 
and yellowish grey is vanilla mist. Well, there you go, that sounds a little bit more interesting. Multicoloured rocks, yes, sorry, that's a really good idea. And there are multicoloured rocks, and maybe you could have great fun in identifying each of the different types of colour here to describe the, the sort of multi mul the multiple colours in your rock. You could do that. That's that's, po that's, that's possible. So there you go. So my advice to you is that um, you either get hold of and download the the geological rock colour chart, which is good. Or you can get hold of some paint charts, some swatches, or and, and that, and I just think that's just a little bit more fun way of describing the rocks. So, so what about the next thing that I'm going to talk about? Now, size. Now, what do I mean by size? So, hang on. What does the rock's colour tell us, Svetlana? Well, the rock's colour, the rock, the rock's colour, is one of the descriptors that we will use, along with all sorts of other things, to help us identify the rock. In itself, if we just describe something as greeny grey, it wouldn't necessarily tell me it was a sandstone or a limestone or a shale or anything else. So it's one of the things, one of the, one of the observers, one of the observations that we use. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is the size, and I'm talking about the particle size. So, for example, if we look at this rock, which is a sandstone, Sandstone is made of sand. It's made of particles of sand which are cemented and glued together to form a rock. The sand grains in a sandstone can vary anything from two millimetres right down to 63 microns, which is, which is a lot finer. That's 0 0.063 millimetres, so it's very fine. So in those two size ranges, you could, you, you'll describe this rock as a sandstone. A granite, on the other hand, has crystals that range from two millimetres up to 16 millimetres. So you can actually do, do a discrimination between the two. You, you can look at these two and just say, OK, well, looking at them, I know this is a sandstone. This one is a granite. Not just on the particle size, but it's one of the observations, along with the colour, along with the other things that we use to help us describe a rock. So this is building up our observations and building up our data and our information about the rocks. So it's really interesting. So one of the things that you can do with a sandstone, um, I realised that because I'm a one of my, my job is that I'm an industrial minerals geologist. So I look at things like sand. Um, do we get Sarah? Do we get different pebbles through glacial action? We certainly do, Sarah. We certainly do. So basically, glaciers pick up rocks from across the country and dump them on the coast and the beach. So if you go on the east coast, you'll see lots of glacial pebbles. All these sorts of things. So going back to what I was talking about about particle size, I've realised with sand because I do DIY at home. Um, I've got various grades of sandpaper, and if you look at sandpaper, you can see. It's normally sand glued to paper, so you can see the different sizes of, of the different greys from very coarse to very fine. Now, if you look at the back of the sandpaper, you will see the sign, this P40, 80, 100, this is, this is the grade of the, of, of, the, of the sand. And what this meat refers to is that the larger the number, the smaller the particles, which is a bit counterintuitive. But it's the way these things are assessed and they're basically sieved. So if you have a sieve and it's a bit technical, if you get a sieve and you draw an inch line across it and count the number of holes, for if you have fewer holes for the larger particles across that inch in a sieve. So that's something I, I'm saying is that what I can do is I can pick this rock up and I can feel using the texture, I can feel it's sandy. I can then maybe go to my sandstone and feel the sandstone. This is obviously paper, so it doesn't feel like anything. But I can say, oh, it feels most like this one. So that means my sample, is my, my grains are going to be roughly the same as the size of the, the sandpaper grade. So just a, whether you want to carry a piece of sandpaper or a whole bunch of sandpaper in your pocket. But it's just an interesting observation that I made. So one thing you can do and... I might have recommended that you, you get your trusty ruler and a piece of paper is you can take a rock like this and we might do it with a microscope. We might then put this on, get, take a photograph, 
and get an image of this. So you could take a photograph and create an image. But what I suggest you do, if you've got a piece of rock like this, like a granite, you can measure the great, you can measure the crystals, okay, and measure as many as you can, and then make a note of the number of grains or crystals of a certain size. And then, using that data, you can make a chart. And here's one I made earlier, okay. So this chart is basically a made up chart and what I've imagined is, is that I've basically measured my granite and I've basically then counted the number of grains or crystals of a particular size and I've plotted them and I've worked out a size, a distribution of sizes and I can say, ah, oh, most of them are in this size, this is the mode. It's also probably the average as well on the median. So that that is a good, nice piece of geological data gathering and you can then classify maybe your rock and there's a classification scheme if you go to the bgs rock classification reports that the scheme reports that I, I mentioned earlier you can then classify your rock is it very coarse coarse medium fine very fine or crypto crystalline well <clears throat> these top ones you can probably just see with your eye these medium and fine you need a hand lens the very very fine ones you're not going to see those without a microscope. So these are really, really tiny. So because crypto crystalline basically is just so fine that it's it's impossible to see without a microscope and very, very fine. You could see very some of these coarser end ones you might be able to see. So if you go to if you go to the rock classification, you can you can actually see this chart. But this is a very nice way of um, describing or classify, helping to help you classify what the rock is. So, <clears throat> we've got the colour and we've got the size. They're the first two things. So, where have we gone? Okay, so, and the third thing I mentioned before was texture. And you've seen some of these things before. Now, the, probably one of the, the, the easiest things to identify is something like this. If you can identify fossils, and if you look at this piece of limestone, you can see what are essentially fragments of fossils in this rock. If you see fossils in a rock, it's very likely to be a limestone. You also get fossils in other rocks like sandstone. <coughs> Here you go. Here's some fossil, fossil wood in a sandstone. Now, if it's a sandstone, you'll be able to feel that it's sandy. So there you go. That's a good clue to the fact that you've got a, a sandstone with fossil in it. So you know this is a sedimentary rock. That's the other thing I would say as well, is that mostly, if you find fossils, you know it's a sedimentary rock. Sometimes you get metamorphic rocks, which have changed sedimentary rocks, and the fossils may survive, but eventually they get destroyed by the heat and the pressure. So you know that it either started life as a sedimentary rock, or it is a sedimentary rock. So here we go. And you can use this to, to identify. I don't think I've got any shell with fossils in. Now, it's harder to tell the difference between a limestone and a shell because they're both very fine. Both of the, the grains are very, very fine, apart from the bits of fossil. Shale will tend to be weaker than a limestone. It might be a bit crumbly, it might break into layers, it might, it might just break apart more easily. So that's one thing. Also, a limestone, <coughs> excuse me, will react with vinegar. If you put a little bit of vinegar on there, or if you take a piece out and crush it up, you'll get a little bit of fizzing. You shouldn't really get that with a, with a shale, unless it's a sort of limey shale. So there you go, that's one texture that you're looking for. It's, that's an easy one, really, I think, if you can identify fossils. And there we go. And then this one again, this is a fossil. Remember, this is our flint pebble with uh, an echinoid or a sea urchin. This is a lovely fossil, one of, the, one of my favorite fossils. Um, so the other thing you might see in a rock as well, you might see layers. Now, there we go, right. So many reasons, many fossils have layers. Oh, here we go. So here we go. Here's another piece of sandstone, and you can just about make out very fine layers in the sandstone. Typically, in a sedimentary rock, the layers are really the, the, the sort of the bedding planes. They are the surfaces in which the sediment was deposited and it gradually builds up. And it may be that this sediment built up very slowly or quite quickly, and then that was compressed and formed a rock. So those sedimentary layers. You can get different layers 
which sort of go in different directions. There's something called cross bedding. If you, if you Google that, cross bedding is where the direction of flow of the sediment changes and it cuts across. So that's quite nice. And you'll see sort of herringbone structures in rocks. So the other thing you might get as well is rocks like this, which is a fabulous metamorphic rock called Nice, which is G-N-E-I-S-S. And you can see the rock, the, the layers here are fantastic. And you've got layers of white and dark, you've got quartz and feldspar and darker minerals. But can you see here at the bottom, this layer is, has done something weird. It's completely distorted and broken up. And this is because the rock has been squished so hard and, 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 and been changed that this layer is just broken up due to that immense pressure. So this is a very interesting piece of rock. In fact, this is a bit of, of gneiss from Scotland, Louisian gneiss. This is over a billion years old, so it's a really, really nice piece of rock, that one. Nice, get it? So, what other things might you find? You might find um, things like this. This is a really interesting rock. Can you see? It's a sort of boring-looking rock, but when you look at the surface, you can see these sort of cracks, and the cracks are just infilled with a white mineral, which might be something like quartz or calcite. And this is known as a septarian concretion or a septarian nod nodule. And you'll find these sometimes, if you're lucky, if you crack these open with a hammer, you might find a fossil inside, or you might not. You might have just destroyed your pebble. So I just like to leave it as it is and just think maybe there might be a, there may be a fossil inside this. I'll never know. I'm not going to take a hammer to my, my lovely rock, my lovely pebbles. So that's another that's another texture. This one I showed you earlier. Can you see the surface of this rock? It's a little bit we describe it as crenulated, and it's the sort of rock is slightly wavy, and you've got little dots of crystals across the surface. So what's happened here is that the when this rock is metamorphosed, it's changed. These sort of like layers have formed, and they've just formed in this sort of like crenulations. So that's a really nice one. Um, what else have I got I can show you? Oh, the other thing I would say as well, the other things you can get in rocks, you can get holes, and these holes might be because of, I don't know, bubbles of gas. So this, 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 is, this piece of lava, this originally had holes in it, and the holes have been infilled with crystals. And in a, a lava like this basalt, the holes are known as vesicles. The vesicles or holes often get infilled with minerals like quartz, calcite, zeolite, other minerals like that. And those are known as amygdales. So this, this rock goes by the fantastic name of amygdaloidal basalt. And it's a really nice rock if you spot that. They're off, these the vesicles are often round, which is a giveaway really for, for, for the fact that they were essentially bubbles of gas trapped in the lava which is then solidified around and the bubble has formed a hole, a perfect spherical hole in the lava and then infilled and then erosion has broken the rock away and then revealed all these lovely sort of like vesicles in the rock. So where are we going? Okay. And the other thing you might see in some rocks as well is you might see some crystals are much larger than the rest of the rock. So here we go. So here we go. This is one of my all-time favourite pebbles, and you may have seen this one before. This one, if you look very careful, has got these larger crystals, and the rest of it is very, very fine. It's a fine lava, but you can see these sort of diamond-shaped crystals in this rock, and we call this porphyry, a porphyry. So this is when you get larger crystals in a fine in a finer matrix of, of of another rock. This one is another one of my favourites. It's a similar sort of rock. This one is known as a quartz porphyry. And you get, if you look, you get large crystals of, of this whitish feldspar, but a little bit hard to see. Nestled in there, there are little crystals of, of glassy quartz, which is fantastic. I think it's a really attractive rock. I think for me, this is one of my favorite rocks. I should have mentioned that this one is called, this one I showed you earlier, is called a rom porphyry because of the shape of the crystals are like rom shaped, like diamond shaped. So that's that's a that's a nice one. And granites again, not in this particular one, but you sometimes get really, really large feldspar 
you might find big um, rectangular um, shapes of feldspar. You, sometimes you see them in a place called Shap and you might see them in Cornwall or in, in, in Scotland. So you get these what they call phenocrysts in, in igneous rocks. Fantastic. Um, so here we go. So let's have a look. Uh, it, this is let's have a look at some of your comments out. Is crystal size better to classify a rock than colour? Hmm, good question. Um, yes and no. Um, colour colour is a descriptor. Particle size is important for certain things. So for example, the size that's for sedimentary rocks like sandstone, the, the, the term sand is a particle size term. So the rock could be made generally made of quartz, but it could be um, it could be um, made of calcite or it could be a volcanic rock, which is just sand sized grains in. So somebody's mentioned something about getting the Munsell chart. Inva, is there a way to get a basic version of the Munsell colour chart without having to pay 100 quid? Well, that really basic version of the, of the colour chart I showed you earlier, this one here as a reminder, if you Google geological rock colour chart, it's a very basic version. But I think it's great for for simple rock descriptions. So I recommend you go online and you Google this and you'll, you'll find a PDF file. Um, so does anyone have any questions for me? I could I could talk all day about pebbles. I'll just sort of carry on. But before I do, one thing I would recommend is that um, if you're interested in uh, identifying the rocks that your pebble that the, of the, the rock type of your pebbles um start off with some books and i can recommend some books oh now this is one of my favorite books the rocks and minerals book it's fantastic and it has some amazing <clears throat> descriptions of rocks and minerals and it's i can't recommend it highly enough there's a smaller version of this book as well so it's also dawn and kindersley that's very good um, <clears throat> if you're a bit more interested uh, this this book here rocks overall this goes into a bit more sort of like detail about the classification of rocks it's fantastic i found this is probably the best book for uh, a budding geologist i think uh it's fantastic um <clears throat> the other book i would recommend which is not out until the 10th of june is this one now this is my book it's called the Pebble Spotter's Guide, it's out on the 10th of June. If you Google it, you'll find it. And some of that, you might recognise some of the pebbles in here. Uh, here we go, let's see if we can find the Econoid. Here we go, you might recognise that one. And that is the pebble I've just shown you. And some of these pebbles that I've been talking about are in this book. So this is actually a book that uh, is produced for the National Trust and it's out soon. So that, buy my book, as they say. Um, there we go. The other thing I might show you, ooh, my little boy wants to know what the gold coloured crystals might be in our pebble. Well, if you find gold coloured crystals, it's very likely to be pyrite. Iron pyrites is known as fool's gold. So I think that's very possible. It may be that. So that that is is a very, very likely to be what you're finding in there. There are other minerals that it may be, but it's probably going to be pyrite. Um, that's a fantastic. That's really nice. If you get some nice pyrite, uh, fantastic. The other thing, if, you, if you're, not all pebbles are natural, you, you might find a pebble like this one. Now, to in, all intents and purposes, if you look, this looks like a bit of a pebbly sandstone. So, but actually, this is a piece of concrete and you'll often find bits of concrete on the beach. I think it's quite a nice, quite a nice pebble in itself. Um, here's another one you might find. And again, this looks like a bit of a, a bit of a sandstone. You might think, oh, are these phenocrysts? Is this some sort of lava? Actually, it's a bit of brick. So a brick that has been on the beach and like all the other pebbles, it's been bashed about and rolled and the, the, the brick has broken down to form a pebble. And the last one as well, this is a weird one. Smells a bit tarry. This is a bit of tarmac that you found, found on the beach. And the reason you get brick, concrete and tarmac on the beach is that often walls and buildings fall into, onto, into the sea and they get washed about and broken down into pebbles. So that's often where these things come from. So I think they're quite nice. Um, you know, that's horses for courses. Um, if you've got any more questions for me, uh, send them on. Here we go. 
Chris and Brenda, what are your top tips for rock identification with kids? Got a stone mad eight year old. Oh, fantastic. Um, what I would say is um, get a book like one of these and get one of these books. Um, one of these, there's a smaller version of this Dorling Kindersley book. In fact, you can find it. Buried in my. Oh no, it's buried. It's buried. It's buried. <laughs> but there is a smaller version of this book as well. So actually, these are really nice. Um, there are other guides that you can get for helping you identify things. And um, like I say, this would be a good guide when it comes out in June. But um, it, it, there are various guides. Um, I can maybe put something on Facebook as well with the video when this goes when this is when this is on 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 the website on the on Facebooks. So can you tell me the author of the Rocks of the World book? <coughs> yes, the author is a guy called John Farnden. So it's a fantastic book. We go. We have large white sparkly stone from our local park. It was used as a decorative stone around the gallery, but had. Let's say, oh, we go. What's that say? I have made its way across the park. My six-year-old daughter was wondering what it might be. Hmm, white sparkly stone. It's very likely that the white sparkly stone is either quartz or marble. It's possibly marble. It may be. It may be like to be quartz. Um, you do often get, or, or or maybe it's just a nice white crystalline limestone. You sometimes get, it's going to be something like that. It's going to be, if it's the difference between quartz and limestone, quartz is a lot harder. And um, if you get a bit of metal, like a metal rule like this, this will scratch a limestone, but it won't scratch a quartz. So you'll tell the sort of hardness you can tell between the two. Um, uh, which book would you recommend for children to identify even novice grannies? <laughs> well, um, like I say, this is a good book for identifying pebbles, the Pebble Spotter's Guide when it comes out. But there are uh, other um, uh, leaflets. I should have got my pebble leaflet out. Oh, where is it? Oh, here we go. So there are some quite nice, there are some other nice guys on pebbles that. This is a really nice one. This is called um, Beach Find, Yorkshire Coast. And if you look, it just has a very, very simple uh, set of rocks. This is really, really nice. Um, I think this cost me about three quid. So that's a really nice one. Um, what else have I got? I got this from the internet as well, a field guide for identifying identification of pebbles. And there's loads here. This is another one. Um, fantastic. So. That field guide to the identification of pebbles. Uh, I got this as well. Pebbles in Essex. Fantastic. Um, what else have I got? The bee just did one. Cornish pebbles. I'm not sure we do that anymore. Um, so yeah, there are various things out there that you can buy. Um, if you go onto Google, you can you'll often find them maybe on Amazon. I've got a lot of these things. I mean, I, I've been collecting these things for years. So uh, how are we doing? Time wise. There we go. So here we go. Let's see if we've got any more questions. There we go. Isn't it easier to look at freshly broken rock surface than at smooth pedal for identification purposes? Yes, you are, you are right. Um, so here we go. Here's a case in point. Um, now, this rock here, this is, I mean, you might be able to identify this one. Often, I mean, this is flint pebble, and this is one of the most commonly occurring pebbles, certainly in the south and east coast. And you'll find this because this has come from the chalk and the chalk used to cover a huge amount. But pebbles are often covered with this sort of white stuff. But usually there'll be a broken surface and you can see the sort of really sort of like quite uh, almost ceramic looking glassy surface inside. And that, that really is, the, is the, an identifier for flint, for a flint nodule. Um, watching you, what is it? Pebbles are fast. Yes, Andrew, pebbles are amazing. I agree with you. Pebbles are fascinating. What exactly do you do for, for the beach? Yes, I'm an interested, I'm interested graduate. Well, it, thank you, Jessica. Uh, I am an industrial minerals geologist and I spend my time working out what rocks and minerals are useful for industrial purposes. So, for example, limestone is good for cement 
and it good for maybe grinding up, but you might add it to paper and other things. And rocks like this, like granite, you might use as construction aggregates. Sand, you might break down sand, and, and certain pure sand might be useful for glass, and so on. So that, that's, that's my job. Will you link the different books? Yes, we can, we can put some information about all the things that I've talked about. A good bibliography, there you go. <laughs> watching any other questions. Oh, here we go. People are putting up links. Fantastic. Um, here we go. Any other questions? Just looking down. Yep, leaflets. We'll do all of that. We'll, 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 we'll find links. I think I've got a little file with all these links in anyway. No worries. I'm, I'm happy that you've enjoyed. I have a rock with a large piece of quartz in the middle surrounded by a black stone. It's one of my favourite one in my collection. Oh, that sounds good. It's, it's hard not seeing pictures of these things because I be might be able to work out what the, the black stone is. Um, best job in the world. Absolutely right. I've been very lucky. Can't wait to watch this again. No, no, my pleasure. What is the pebble that lights up under a UV lamp? Well, probably fluorite. I mean, there are other fluorescent minerals, but it's probably fluorite. Um, there will be other things, um, but if, if, if you've got it, if it's a sort of purple, greenish, purpley colour, often with, with sort of square crystals, cubic crystals. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. I think, I think, folks, we are coming towards the end. So if you've got any more questions, I'm still, I'm still here. I've still got 71 people watching. Oh, yes. Oh, no, that's not, not, oh, I don't, uh. Sorry to hear about spamming, that's not great. You released by my sister. Well, get out there. What I would recommend, it's a lovely sunny day. If you're near anywhere where you can, um, you can find pebbles, get out there and, and find them and try and work out what there are. You know, you can do the colour, the size, the texture, get a book. If you, if you, and if you can't work out what they are, to, uh, send me a message may, and, and to the BGS Facebook and, I, and hashtag RockDoc. I'll help you work out what your, uh, your pebble is. Oh, tell us about the meteor out fine this morning. That's fantastic. I read about that. That was a, I think it was called a carbonaceous uh, a meteorite. And it's quite rare. And it came down, I think it was in Gloucestershire. And I think basically it was scattered remains over a large area and somebody found some on a driveway and they donated it to science. Fantastic. I think very lucky because it was it was freshly preserved because it was it was so recent. No, oh, thank you, Naomi. I, I enjoyed giving it. <laughs> so as you can see, um, there's lots of resources if you if you look there, but uh, just need to get back to the beach. I'm with you, Diane. Uh, I'll be back. I'll be going to the beach. There are lots of good beaches. How rare are meteorites? Um, I think there are. I think there are. Um, they're not. They're not so rare that you never find them, but I think they are comparatively rare. And I think that the, the, the rarity of a meteorite is, is its preservation, because if it lands on the um, land, it often gets destroyed, especially in a wet climate, and you get weathering and erosion, and they break down really quickly. You're more likely to find them in somewhere like the desert, where it's nice and dry, and they maybe just sit on the, on the surface. Um, yes, yes, Flora. Go hunt. Yes, pebble hunting is my first priority oh okay thank you great talk thank you so much everyone so what are my plans for future talks i have a i have a, a feeling it may be another pebble talk <laughs> that's very likely i'm going to do some more videos i'm probably going to focus some videos on the, the three aspects i talked about color size and texture i do talks all the time um but they're mostly about industrial color crystal size any other indications to classify there are, but often there are things that you need to look at, the mineralogy, the chemistry, the things that you really need to take your, your rocks to a laboratory and maybe get some sections taken. So if you look at the BGS rock classification scheme, you will find the whole, all of the sort of criteria there. So you will find that if you go, if you just Google BGS rock classification scheme, there's one for igneous, metamorphic, sedimentary, and also artificial as well. So here we go. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks. Here we go. Watch the last video. Oh, nice to hear, Jane, that you've got a magnifying glass for Christmas. Fantastic. <laughs> so here we go. Check out Caithness Science Festival for Meteorite. So, oh, very good. Thanks, thanks, Chris and Brenda. Yes, you can send a picture about the rock you found. Send it to, to the BGS. Do you have a link? Some industrial talks would be interesting. Thank you. No, I'm be more than happy to do an industrial talk. I do some marvellous talks about um, industrial minerals. 
Sand is one of my favourite topics. Um, so, Emma, you're just coming in just at the end, I'm afraid. <laughs> we just nearly finished. Um, so I, th I think uh, I'm just going to stick around. So if anyone has any more questions, I'm, 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 I'm more than happy to answer them. If not, I'll just sort of like start, I'll start t telling you about the rest of my Pebble collection. What else do I have here? Oh, this is a particularly nice piece. This is another limestone. This has got coral fossils in and you can see the sort of dots. And if you look, they're actually, you can see the dots are more tubes. And this is actually uh, a colonial coral. So you'd often find this in, in, in uh, warm tropical seas like the Caribbean, say, for example. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> this is another really nice one. This one is called Schist. And can you see how shiny the surface is? And that is basically mica. It's a metamorphic rock. And it's, it's a little bit similar to this, the phyllite. It was made from mud, which has been uh, metamorphosed. And eventually all the mud uh, minerals have, have turned into mica. So that's a very nice, the sort of layered in layers. Um, this one, this is chalk. Um, it's not the same. Chalk isn't the same as the stuff that you might use in school because this is too hard. To use on a blackboard. Chalk, school chalk is made from gypsum which is much softer. So this, this chalk um, is, is lovely. You'll find this uh, in lots of parts of the country. You get chalk uh, in the south and the east. There's a big swathe of chalk going up the country so that's really nice. It's quite soft. So what will happen is this, this won't survive very long on the beach So, but you do find, um, yes, so we often see holes in chalk pebbles are these made from creatures in the region? Well, um, the pebbles, may, you might be talking about these ones maybe, in the flint pebbles, you might find holes in the chalk. And I think sometimes they actually might be animals that have burrowed into them. So it might be existing sea creatures. So it may not be from the actual rock formation. It may be that there's a, a sea creature that has burrowed a hole in them. You do often get that holes drilled into rocks by sea creatures. Uh, sometimes you'll find holes in flint pebbles, but what's happened is this forms in the rock and it sort of, the rock forms around the hole, which is a bit weird. So you get all sorts of weird and wonderful shapes of flint pebbles. Um, what else have we got? More granite. I think I've, I think I've come to the end, folks. <laughs> so I, I think, um, unless there's any more, any more questions, I'm going to... Oh, here we go. There we go, there's a nice link there. Direct the questions to inquiries at bgs.ac.uk. So, uh, off, to, oh, off to buy a pebble book, yes. I have a similar garden with micros. Oh, very nice to hear. Um, meteorite. Manhattan Schist, the name fascinates me. Yes, I remember that was referred to in one of Ian Stewart's programmes. I think he went to Manhattan. Yes. Hashtag RockDoc on Twitter, at BritGeoSurvey. If you want to send me any, any pictures, I'm more than happy to help identify any rocks and pebbles that you've got. Um, so I'm happy to stick around for, for, for a few more minutes, folks. I think my voice is going. <laughs> so. <clears throat> any more questions, anyone? <sighs> any more rocks to tell you about? Um, no, I think I think that's it, folks. I'm going to finish then, everybody. Uh, I'm going to say cheerio, and uh, oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. Rhiannon, you just got in there before I disappeared. What strength would you recommend for a child magnifying glass? I would recommend times 10 or times 20. And do you mean a magnifying glass like this, or do you mean like a hand lens like this? Now, either are good. These are better because you can protect the lens in its little case. These are a little bit harder. I don't normally take this when I go to the beach because I think it will just get scratched. So I just use this in my office. I say office. <laughs> I mean back bedroom at home <laughs> where I am at the minute. So I'd recommend you get a little hand lens like this times 10. I think this one says I think this is a times 10. Yeah, I think so. This is a good one. This is a nice one because you can see it's got a light. 
<laughs> and that's good because it's quite gloomy in this country. So it's actually quite handy to have one with the light built in. Um, like I said before, this is my favourite one, but I got that one from France. And this one, I'm not sure if you can get these, uh, these, this particular one anymore, but ones like this, this are really nice and they, they, they work really, really well. So times 10 or times 20, I recommend. Go. Cheers, everybody. That's leaving. Hand lens. Hand lens. L-E-N-S. Uh, right. OK, everybody. Cheerio. I'll, I will see you next time I do a talk. I'm going to click the finish button now then. Cheerio, everybody.